In our weekly reading, Toldot, there is a, an interesting dispute between Ibn Ezra and Ramban. And uh, it uh, uh, mostly has to do with why a Sav would sell his birthright, uh, his presumably including the firstborn's portion, which is double portion later in the Torah, why would he sell it for just some food? There are a lot of different answers given. First of all, it's not clear at all whether uh, the firstborn's uh, portion was actually a double portion then. Later, the Torah would tell us in the, the book of Dvarim that the firstborn gets double portion, but it's not clear at all that that's what the firstborn used to get in, in those times. The, therefore, maybe there was no actual financial benefit anywhere. It was a very small benefit. Uh, in fact, that's what Ramban is inclined to, uh, to believe, as we'll get to in a moment. There's also a possibility that yeah, Esau didn't really sell it for just the food. The food was a kind of, uh, um, I guess, procedure to show that uh, the transaction is finished. But it could be that ya Yaakov did pay him something, which the Torah doesn't discuss. That was the opinion of Radak, one of the great commentators. We have him on more, many, most probably, of the books of the Nevi'im and Ktuvim in the Mikraot Gdolot, in the standard editions of the commentaries of the Torah. Usually on Nevi'im and Ktuvim, Radak is printed together with, with Ralbag and, uh, of course, Rashi, and uh, sometimes Ibn Ezra, if Ibn Ezra exists on those uh, books. But in the books of Humash, we only have Radak on one book, and that is Breshit, and it wasn't printed in the standard editions, but it is available on the internet, of course, as everything today. So this uh, commentary of Radak is not quite as popular on the Humash, on the, on the, on the first book of Moshe. And the other ones, we don't have it all together. And on Breshit, we have a commentary of Radak, which some, sometimes is quoted, but it's nowhere near as popular as the other standard commentators. But uh, Ramban apparently did have access to it and uh, uh, sometimes seems to be quoting it. Uh, or maybe uh, Ramban doesn't say really which, which commentator he's quoting. Maybe it was some other commentator where he saw such a thing. But he himself doesn't agree that this is what uh, uh, the Torah means uh, here. So he thinks that the financial benefit, if it existed at all, it was very minor. And uh, there are a lot of commentators that actually say the same thing, that the, the issue wasn't a major physical benefit. Uh, being a firstborn at that time meant other type of uh, maybe uh, owner or maybe some spiritual benefits. But whatever the case may be, by the way, I once mentioned that uh, uh, Professor Oman, a Nobel laureate and an Orthodox Jew uh, who lives in Israel, very old man already, Shlita, may Hashem give him long years, uh, he uh, uh, used to discuss a lot of these uh, concepts of the Talmud and economics. And one of the concepts which he bases on the Talmud in the Masechet Makot uh, discusses that something that uh, it's, it's called risk aversion in today's language. So something that you don't have right now, even if in the future it could bring you a lot of money with some probability, people are not going to pay so much for. Meaning most people, they would rather get, uh, you know, something like $50 right now than, let's say, $100 with a probability of one half. That maybe they'll get a hundred, maybe they'll get nothing. It's not equivalent to fifty dollars. It's much less than that. Most people don't like risk. They'd rather have fifty for sure than a hundred with a probability of one of one half, something like this. And if it's going to be in a long period of time as well, that's an additional factor. If you're going to get a hundred dollars, let's say ten years from now, maybe, then it's not even worth ten dollars today. Um, maybe not even worth five dollars today. Something that you might get many years from now might not even live till that time period. So I, I'm thinking that maybe you could use this type of a risk aversion idea as well, that from the point of view of Asaph, something that even if birthright meant a lot of money, but this is only at some point long from now when uh, his father dies, and maybe he won't even live that long, and even if he lives that long, how much is it worth right now? So, uh, so he, wasn't, he was willing to, to go for something that he could get immediately, some food, he was hungry, so he was willing to, to, to take some food right now rather than wait till maybe he'll get uh, more money when, when his father dies. Whatever the case may be, that's not what I want to discuss. I want to discuss the dispute specifically between Ibn Ezra and uh, Ramban. And that is, 
Ibn Ezra thinks apparently that there was a double portion uh, that was at stake and uh, he does not consider it logical that uh, Yitzhak, uh, that, um, sorry, Asaf would not uh, value it even more than just a, a plate of food. There's no way that Yitzhak, that Asaf would, would, would sell the, the birthright, the double portion for the plate of food, unless this double portion was very small. So therefore, Ibn Ezra is sure that Yitzhak at the time was very poor. So that's why there was now a major advantage of being a firstborn, even if you get a double portion. The, the inheritance that he would get from Yitzhak was, was very, very small. The problem with this approach, of course, is that it seems that when, uh, when uh, Avram died, Yitzhak was quite rich. Avram was rich and, he, and Yitzhak inherited everything from Avram. On top of it, uh, Hashem specifically blessed him. So it sounds unlikely that he would be poor. So and then Ibn Ezra says, what, you've never seen people who become poor? They were rich and they became poor? It can happen. He also lost his vision at the end of his life. He was either completely blind or legally blind, what they call today. Right? So, so certain things happened to Yitzchak for whatever reason it happened. Right? You can't say that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, a, a rich person you know, necessarily will, will remain rich all his life. By the way, Ibn Ezra himself was poor all his life. But at any rate, that's the shit of Ibn Ezra. Now Ramban very strongly argues with it and says that the whole thing makes no sense. Because look, he says, uh, at the time when uh, uh, Yitzchak uh, inherited Avram, right? At the time of death of Avram, uh, he was rich. Uh, now, by the way, Hazal say, interestingly, that uh, this whole episode uh, that... The ch the ch uh, that uh, Yaakov bought the birthright from Esav was at the time when Avram died. So this is presumably when Yitzchak just inherited all the property from Avram. Maybe Avram gave already this property to Yitzchak during his lifetime. But whatever the case may be, Yitzchak was rich at some point in his time. Then, according to Ibn Ezra, at the time when the birthright was sold, he was poor. Then it says that when he went to Grar, to uh, uh, Philistines, right? This was the territory, uh, more or less where today's major area of uh, dispute is. It's still uh, the same area, even though the people who live there have nothing to do with Plishtim. The ancient Plishtim, the Philistines, is not what the Palestinians are today. The Palestinians today are just Arabs who started calling themselves Palestinians less than 100 years ago. But the area is the same area uh, near Egypt. It was apparently Yitzchak was on the way to Egypt, and then Hashem appeared to him and said, don't go to Egypt, stay here. And he stayed during hunger years in Grar and near it, in Beersheba, future Beersheba. So anyway, when uh, uh, Yitzchak was there, it says that he became rich. So, says Ramban, uh, that if later, when he was giving the actual birthright, when he was giving his blessing, according to Benazir, he was poor again. And uh, when it says that uh, uh, when his uh, mom, Rivka, told Yaakov to go and get a couple of goats, she said, Lechna Latson, go to the flock. So Ibn Ezra says it was the place where the flock used to be. It's not the actual flock because they were poor, according to him. It was the, the, almost the last goats they had, according to this. So says Ramban, it makes no sense. What, what happened to Yitzchak in his lifetime? He, be, he was rich, and he became poor, then he became rich again, then he became poor again. The whole thing sounds like a joke. And then he goes on to say that altogether, it's, uh, after the blessing of Hashem, he wouldn't become poor. But I just want to mention one little uh, idea that I had, a uh, small chidush, that it seems to me, Ibn Ezra everywhere says that the Torah doesn't have to be chronological. Now, this is an idea that you find already in Hazak, but Ibn Ezra uses it more, almost, almost more than any other commentator. Ramban, on the contrary, always tries to say that by default the Torah is in chronological order unless proven the opposite. Meaning unless the Torah says specifically that something uh, happened before, then you know in, in the book of Bermuda you find such a thing that there's cases where something is mentioned uh, earlier, but it's clear from the dates that it was actually later than something that's mentioned later. So unless the Torah says it's not in chronological order, what was assumed it should be? That's the shit of Ramban. By the way, Vilna Gaon, the Grau, also thought like Ramban. But most commentators, including Rashi and others, and in Hazal you find at least some shit thought like that, find that there are certain psukim that we could actually say 
happened before the, uh, the, the even though they're written later. The Hukutora is generally not in chronological order, so, so you could, uh, for whatever uh, reasons you have in terms of explaining things, you could always say that this really happened at a different time period. So it seems to me that Ibn Ezra thought that the episode between Esav and Yaakov, when Yaakov bought the birthright, happened much later, not, a, not before the episode when Yitzchak was in Grar. And uh, this makes a lot of sense, Leonid Dati, uh, that the Torah always tries to finish one uh, subject and then go on to the other, even though if, if it chronologically the second, uh, the second story happened before the end of the first story. So the Torah wants to tell us immediately the difference between Yaakov and Esav. It says their names, it says what they became, and it says how Yaakov saw, uh, bought the birthright from Esav. Now, this could have happened many, many years later. Ibn Ezra doesn't have to subscribe to the Midrash of Hazal that it happened when Avram died, and therefore these, these boys were really pretty small, relatively speaking, right? They were um, somewhere around 15 at the time Avram died. So it doesn't have to be that this happened when they were 15, according to Ibn Ezra. Could be it happened when they were, uh, let's say, 35 or something, or any other age. So when it says later uh, in the Torah, but chronologically earlier possibly, when Yitzhak went to Grar, it doesn't mean that he was poor. He was actually, he had quite a bit of property inherited from Amram, but because it was hunger years, and hunger years, even if you're rich, you don't necessarily get enough bread. So he went to Grar. And there he became even more rich. And only later in his life, when the birthright was sold, and still later, a little bit later, when, uh, when Yitzchak was blessing his, uh, his uh, son, on, on that time already Yitzchak was poor at the end of his life. So that's what I think Ibn Ezra believes. I don't think he believes that Yitzchak was getting poor and rich a few times in his life. Most likely he was rich for most of his life and became poor at the end of his life. And that's why also he was so attached to Esav, which is what the Torah tells us in the beginning. It didn't necessarily have to happen in the beginning. The Torah again tells us the different natures of Esav and Yaakov, and it tells us right away certain things that may have happened years and years later. It says that uh, uh, he was constantly feeding him and taking care of him, Esav, the, the older son. And, Yaakov, and Yitzchak became attached to his son, Kitzayit Bifiv, whatever that means, uh, if, if, if this means that because he was constantly fed by him, he, uh, Yitzchak became attached to him, this could have happened years later when Yitzchak was already getting old and couldn't take care of himself and he needed Esav constantly to serve him. And Esav was very good at that. That's the one thing Esav was good at. He was uh, um, very much uh, into uh, what they called Kivud uh, in this case only Kivud Av. But with Rivka, he didn't have a good relationship. But Yitzhak, he always tried to uh, show his great uh, honor to his father. Had special clothing, according to Hazar, in which he would dress to serve his father. So that's, uh, that may have happened only already in later years, when Yitzhak became very much uh, not functional by himself. Um, last but not least, I want to mention that uh, the quote of... Uh, uh, Hasidic Rebbe of uh, Naftali Tzvi you know, from Ropshitz that um, the reason Yitzchak didn't recognize the true nature of this hypocrite Esav is because Yitzchak never really met such a thing before. He, like all his life, he was sh in a way uh, uh, sheltered, right? He, he, he had a life where he was always surrounded by uh, uh, truthful people. He never really imagined that his son could be such a liar, such a, um, such a hypocrite. As opposed to Rivka, she grew up in a family of hypocrites with Lavan and others, so therefore she understood the nature of Esav much better than her husband, who uh, became attached to his son, not realizing his true nature. Now, this is not the only explanation. I just wanted to mention this because I think it sounds interesting. Like people who never meet. Uh, there's a lot of such situations today also. There's a lesson to learn. And a, lot, a lot of people who never really meet true evil. They were sheltered all their lives. They, they only met good. It's like a cat that everybody just uh, pets. And, you know, that, she, she, they, that cat may never know that there could be creatures out there that would want to kill it, would want to hurt it. She never met such a thing. 
So there are such people also in America. There are plenty of such people who always lived in a good neighborhood, never really dealt uh, directly with any crime. So they assume that the nature of every person is just to be good. Therefore, there's nothing to worry. It's, uh, it's these, uh, uh, um, what they think is the people from the right who are always scaring everybody, who, who tell us all these uh, terrible stories. No, the, the truth is everybody is good. Everybody wants the same thing. There's no real evil. Right? We, we shouldn't uh, panic. That's a, lot of, a lot of people have such an approach without realizing that it's just their life experience is uh, uh, that they never met anything in their lives that, that, that is scary. Anyway, I'm going to end on this, and if you like this video, please press like.